the square of opposition, the relationship of quantifiers in a categorical syllogism. So the square of opposition is just a simple tool that philosophers and logicians use to actually diagram the quantifiers in a categorical syllogism. It shows us the relationship between contradictories, contraries, subalterns, and subcontraries uh, with relation to the quantifiers indicating the values of the propositions under consideration. So on the corners of the square, um, you will have the quantifiers, the four quantifiers in a categorical syllogism being all, no or none, some, and some or not. So there are only ever four quantifiers in a categorical syllogism. If you've got something else, there's something wrong. So let's look at the sort of first separation in the square of opposition. So this line here that I'm drawing to divide the square of opposition into an upper half and a lower half are indicators for us to separate the difference between what are known as universal quantities and particular quantities. Now, universal quantities are those ones that are all-encompassing in the category. So, for instance, if I'm talking about um, the category of dogs, if I'm using a universal quantity and I'm saying, for instance, that all dogs are furry, what that means is that in the entirety of the known universe, that I'm corralling together all of the dogs that we can possibly have, putting them in one spot and calling that our category of dogs. All right, so that's the all quantity. The no quantity is everything outside of that. So if we're not talking about dogs, we're talking about all those other things, like, you know, tables and chairs and rats and bats and whatever, all right? Uh, anything that is not a dog is you know, that quantity of outside of that circle, all right? You know, the quantity of where we don't have it. Um, and so those universal quantities are those ones that are all-encompassing, all right? So think of it on a universal scale. So we're not talking about one small subsection of, you know, German shepherds or, you know, uh, you know it's all yip, yip dogs like the, you know, like the little um, chihuahuas and that sort of thing, right? So we're not talking about small classes of dogs. If we're talking about all dogs, we mean every possible thing that we can consider a dog is in that class. Now, if we look at the bottom half and look at what are called particular quantities, particular quantities are those individual quantities or those small classes out of the category. So if we want to talk about the category of dogs, the particular instances would be German Shepherds, right, as a class of that category. Or perhaps we want to talk about the Chihuahuas, or maybe we're talking about those robotic dogs like the Ibo or whatever you want to call it. Um, but anything that happens to be a subset of that class is a particular quantity. Now here's another division in that square of opposition. We have what are called the affirmatives, right? the affirmations all right, of our propositions, and we also have our negations. Now, of course, under the affirmative column, you have the positive quantifiers. So all of the category or maybe some of the category, these are all, you know, um, instances, all right, uh, positive instances of that category that we're talking about. Negation, on the other hand, is the absence of that, that um, thing that we're talking about. So for instance, if we're talking about no dogs, we're talking about the absence of dogs or those things that are not dogs, those things that are the opposite, you know, uh, nature of dogs. So maybe we're talking about cats instead of dogs, or, you know, we're not saying that there's anything at all there. Um, in the other particular instance of that class, some are not, right? So we have some dogs are furry. Maybe we have some that are not furry, all right? And so maybe we're coming across those hairless dogs or, or something of that nature. So some are not is, is a negation of that, uh, of that instance. All right, so we have universals, particulars, we have affirmation, negation, all right, and so we have four quadrants basically of this square of opposition, so these are all sort of separators to, to help us divide up those, those quantifiers. Now, on the top end, let's look at our universal quantities, all versus no. 
And so with this quantifier, these sets of quantifiers, there is a relationship between them. And that relationship between them is that they are what are known as contraries. Contraries. Both quantities cannot be true at the same time. For example, all dogs are furry. No dogs are furry. One statement can be true while the other is false, but both statements cannot be true at the same time. However, it is possible to show both statements to be false at the same time. So, for if we were able to find one or two examples of dogs that are furry while the rest are not, then we show the statement that no dogs are furry is obviously false. Also, since we find only some dogs are furry instead of all dogs, the statement that all dogs are furry is patently false as well. And so, here's a situation where we can have the two universal quantities false, Right, that all dogs are furry and no dogs are furry are both false statements. While we show in reality, perhaps, we can point to a subset of dogs that are furry. And so we have a particular quantity, some, being true, but the universal quantities being false. And so that's the idea of a contrary. And it only happens with the universals. Now let's look at subcontraries. Subcontraries are similar contraries, except we're dealing with particular quantities. So the quantities of some and some are not. Let's look at this a little bit more closely. Subcontraries. In this case, both quantities cannot be false at the same time. So for example, some dogs are furry. Some dogs are not furry. Now, in this case, both statements must be true, because together, both the statements actually describe the entire class of beings. However, it's not possible to show both statements to be false at the same time, because if we do this, then we deny the entire category altogether that we're concerned with. And at that point, what are we really talking about? Opposing corners on the square of opposition. This is probably the biggest, most important concept on the square of opposition altogether. This is the idea of contradiction. Now this is the one that Aristotle establishes as a rule of logical reasoning. Um, the fact that we need to avoid contradiction wherever possible. And so on the square of opposition we can diagram this with the opposing corners and it kind of gives us a nice you know, a uh, way of showing that these opposites are, are opposed to each other on diagonals here. Uh, but let's look at this a little bit more closely. Contradiction. This is actually what Aristotle bases um, the law of reasoning uh, of non-contradiction on. In this case, both quantities cannot be true at the same time and cannot be false at the same time. So for example, to make some statements here, for example, um, all dogs are furry and some dogs are not furry. If one statement is true, then the other statement must be false. This is the quality of contradiction that makes it a powerful tool in logical analysis. If one statement is established to be true, then the other statement must be precluded from also being true or vice versa. This is known as indirect proof, or proof by contradiction. In Latin it's known as reductio ad absurdum, which basically just simply means that, uh, you know, if you have, uh, if you have the um, statement being made once, um, to go through your logical analysis and end up with the, you know, contradictory, um, reduces the argument to an absurdity, and so it cannot be accepted. In which case, what mean, what happens is, is there's actually something wrong, right, in what happens with the argument. Or that's supposedly what we're led to believe. Um, and so really what it boils down to is, this is the big no-no, right, that we try to avoid. 
Um, and so contradiction has a sort of flip-flop nature to it, that if one is true, the other can't be. Um, if the other is true, then the former can't be. And so, again, you have this sort of flip-flop nature. So one thing has to, has to apply, and only one thing has to apply. Um, and that's the nature of, of contradiction. And it's very different from, of course, the contraries and subcontraries that we looked at, because there the statements could coexist in one instance, where whether it be true or be false. But uh, with contradiction, you can't have both of those statements being true or false at the same time. It has to be one or the other. And so that's where we get, uh, again, that sort of nature of, uh, of something being true or false. That's contradiction. So the last thing to discuss then is the idea of subalternation. Subalternation is the ability for us to take a universal statement, a universal quantifier, and draw a particular conclusion from it. So the ability for us to say that all dogs are furry and to naturally go down to the particular instance of some dogs being furry. These are both truthful statements and it is possible to go from the universal statement directly down to the particular statement uh, through this idea of subalternation. So the particular quantifier of sum is the subaltern of all. Similarly, the particular instance, sum or not, is a subaltern of the um, universal uh, quantifier of none. Now, subalternation only works in one direction. Subalternation can go from the universal down to the particular. And this is more or less the same distinction between the idea of maybe perhaps the, the concept of deduction, even, right? Where we establish a overarching rule, you know, like all dogs are furry, and then drawing the deductive conclusion that some are furry because um, we're able to, um, to look at that particular instance from the established rule. Now, to go in the other direction would imply a sort of inductive logic. Right, where we say, well, here's a particular instance of a dog being furry. Here are some other dogs that are furry, but can we make the statement that all dogs are furry without actually seeing the entire universal set? And according to the traditional square of opposition, um, this is not possible. And so subalternation only works in one direction. And really, that's what you have for the square of opposition. All of these quantifiers that are available for us to use in our categorical logic um, stated in these terms and, and the way that they oppose each other and so on and so forth help us, helps us to, to navigate our way through a, an actual argument.